We're going to start out with what we call a moral simulation, which is basically where we start an experience that you, you just join in and you imagine that it's all real. And as part of that simulation, we're going to have different decisions or questions coming up. Um, and all of us try to make decisions um, about those different questions and then try to understand how those different interventions or decision moments um, kind of demonstrate different ethical theories, actually. We'll go into it. Um, we're going to share the ethical framework that our project has put together, um, specifically LSE and ITU. And then lastly, we're going to kind of just openly have a discussion about that experience, how it went. Um, and how it might shift the way we think about futures. So that's the very abstract agenda for you, but it will make sense at the end, I promise. But to begin with, we're now entering our moment of a moral simulation. And we're working at a company. This company has only the most positive ideas forward. We care. We care a lot. And our company is called Wearwell. Wearwell's biggest focus is the work-life ba balance because we believe people are too stressed and too rushed out there. But this can be made different. So we developed a product. We developed a product that's called Wearwell. It's a band that uh, it's a wearable band um, that uh, records has a bunch of sensors that records various things about the body and how people, um, how people are feeling. And uh, we're offering this uh, as a program that employers can use. Um, they can sign up, and they can have the devices, and they can give them, up to, give, give them out to their employees. But today, we invited you, our design team, our very diverse and very experienced design team, to make one of the foundational decisions about this product. What you have in front of you is a device specification. A device specification, basically, we've made a lot of decisions about what the device is and what it can be. So these are the things that we think are possible with this device. We have some of our goals listed. We want to provide goal setting capability. We want to provide some push notifications, perhaps communicating with managers, perhaps the ability to snooze reminders. Um, we have our approach here and some device sensors that we've decided to put into the device. Next. And we also wanted to see, well, we can measure impact in different ways. Uh, we also gave some uh, thought to security and privacy. Um, and we thought about some other options that we'll discuss later. But today, today we're, we need to make a decision that will define what will be possible out of all of those options in the device specification that you see. So I'm going to give you a minute to take a look at the device specifications. Just this is sort of where we've been coming from. There's been a lot of discussions so that you're familiar with the product and where we're going. And then I'm going to um, tell you about the decision that we need to make. So I'm going to give you a minute. Please take a look. The next thing that's coming is once I explain the decision, I'm going to ask you to vote with your feet for the decision. OK, so give your critical minds a rest. Join the company no matter what. We're paying you good salaries. <laughs> you don't want to join over there? We're a company, right? What? We are. I quit. This is nonsense. I can't believe you guys tried to get into this one. So there's no reason for people's trust and ability to be themselves. OK. Good luck paying rent next month. Bye. Some of us have to pay rent next month. Yeah. OK, so <laughs> options. We have options that the most important decision that we need to make is because this is a data-intensive device. And we're providing a data-intensive service. And so the first and the most foundational decision that we need to make is what do we do with the data how do we treat the data? So this will define what options we have, what we can offer as services, to whom, 
and in some ways we'll also define what role this kind of device can have in a company situation. So, option A. Option a. Our option A is what you will probably recognize as the most privacy-friendly option, looking at the employee um, and providing the employee with some of the benefits of having a tracker, um, given the fact that what we do is we track the employee, but all the data is stored locally on the device. All we get is basic aggregates to make sure the device is being used and any error, um, error reporting that's coming off the device because we're also testing and it is our obligation to make sure the device works. When you say we, is that wearable? Wearable. Is that the wearable. Wearable. So we get all our clients absolute data. Yeah. The, 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 clients, the, client, the, the clients don't get the data. The data is on the device. We don't get the data. You, you, sell, you sell this to a company. Yeah, the company, the, the company gets aggregate reports of this is the number of steps all of your employees have walked. This is, that's we it. As Wearwell, selling the device, we, get that data. We, we as Wearwell get aggregates. So once a week we get an aggregate of steps walked. Which makes them data analysis. Huh? Which makes them data analysis. Well, we... We have, we, have, um, we have some algorithms that are on the device and we, this limits how much we can do and how much we can offer because there's only so much that we can run locally on the device. This clearly limits also the capacity for us to, um, to provide any additional services or advice and to really do the kind of data analysis that would require more computational capacity that is available, that is, that is available on the device. But all the data stays in the device, and it's very limited amount of information that comes off it, and the employee has all the decision-making power. When in terms of device, do you mean just the tracker, or tracker and I'm assuming there's a companion like a mobile phone? Tracker and mobile phone. Okay, so that's, that's, that's really yes, but it's, it, the, 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 the connection is, um, is Bluetooth only, and everything stays local. Yeah. Nothing travels except for errors and very general reports. You can, yes, oh, absolutely, but, but there's limits. Yeah. Again, what, with what you can do. I mean, imagine you have a mobile phone that has like almost no memory left because there's so many pictures on it. You know, there's limits. If you use, if you use, if you use Bluetooth, uh, you don't, you don't, well, no, because you use Bluetooth only when you turn it on to transfer, transfer data to the... Does it have to be? Sure, sure, but if you use any of the step trackers, if you have Bluetooth on all the time, it just drains the battery. So what you do is you, you, turn, on, you, you, know, you, you turn it on to connect. It can only recognize it when the Bluetooth radio is switched on. You can switch off the Bluetooth radio. No. No. I mean, it'll still count steps. It'll still count steps. It'll still tell you what your heart rate is. It doesn't need to be connected to the mobile phone to do that. Sure, sure. It has a little display. It tells you how many steps you've done. It buzzes when you reached your goal. You know, doesn't need to be connected. You can make this. You can offer very little then in terms of what it can do, but you can make this as privacy. Okay, we're going to come up with our own options later if the range of options we present are unacceptable to us as people working here. Let me go on to the option B. Are, are we, can we? No, well, I just also suggest that the aggregate report um, uh, may be inadequate broadly because the data collection in itself may be inadequate. So let's say you 
let's say someone wants, or if one of the things is uh, the quality of interaction between managers and employees. Then we can't offer that if we choose this option. Yeah, yes? This option doesn't yeah. necessarily allow for granularity of understanding if a manager actually has face-to-face -face, um, contact Absolutely. with their employees or just sits there behind a flag complaining. Absolutely. This is, why, this is what I mean, is that we've choose this option that limits severely the kinds of features that we can do. between them is either always distant or passive aggressive. Sure, sure. There are, there are clearly limits. And this is interesting because this is a decision about, this is a decision deciding where you want, well, how you want to deal with data is a fundamental arch system architecture decision. So this is what we're doing. We're making a fundamental system architecture decision today. So keep your thoughts in mind. You can also maybe create. Your we own will. Options. We will be coming back to these right. options over and over. This is. We're almost there. Come on. Option B. So option B. Track but store data. So in order for us to pr to to give some more options, what we can do is we can actually get the data off the the mobile phone. Uh, but we store it for a very short amount of time. So we can then provide more, um, more computational power, and that means more uh, services on the granular data. The company still gets the same sort of very aggregate reports, but uh, we can provide more services um, and more alerts potentially if we, can, if we can see the granular data, which it doesn't stay on the device. But we then commit to storing temporarily only, and that temporarily meaning once we provide the service, the data gets deleted. Next, option C, we track everything. And we can do, if we keep the data longer, we can do A-B testing on some of the new features that we provide, uh, really do some of the more agile and in the moment product improvements, um, and uh, um, look at patterns over time to see if things work. But again, the company only gets aggregate reports, but this allows us to really develop the product much further. Um, and uh, it gives us quite a lot more flexibility as a company to develop our product into something much better. And option D is the more familiar one. We get all the data, we hand it all, we keep it to do all the development we need, and we hand it all over to the company so that they can also share it with third parties like insurance providers and develop uh, a suite of services that go between both the management and then the employees, et cetera, et cetera. Are these four options clear, more or less? You've got them in your mind? OK, perfect. So stand up. And in this first moment, we're just going to ask you to go with your understanding of the situation now and come stand in front of whichever option you're up for designing with. Um, if there's none of the options that works for you, maybe we're going to create like new clusters, but we'll get there. For now, just try to find an option that aligns with how you want to continue designing this product. Come over here. Option A, option B, option C, and option D. And as you see on the slide, A is about tracking but storing data locally. B is about tracking but storing data temporarily. C is track but don't share with the company. Share only with Wearwell for A-B testing. And D is full data sharing both with the company that is putting this on their employees and with where well us. All right, so we've got a couple folks over here at A, one at B, a few at C. No one is at D and some outliers who don't stand anywhere. E, okay, perfect. So what we're gonna do is just group by group, we're gonna just ask if anybody would like to tell us about what led them to 
towards that certain option. We can't have every single person talk, but if there's somebody within each group, that would be great. So we can kind of understand the diversity of opinions. Um, why don't we start over here? Option A. Can anybody share what brought them towards this option? So I think the first question is what you asked, or whoever, if it's obligatory or voluntary. If it's obligatory because the company is uh, paying for it and needs the data, then that's your A is your best option. Um, if it's voluntary, I doubt, you know, some people will never wear this uh, handcuff. Um, <laughs> when you do wear it, uh, I agree with all the problems about the fact that you just push a button doesn't mean that it's not tracking. In fact, that's how most most uh, murders or whatever, most things the police finds is through the mobile phone or the SIM card or whatever. So I think uh, of these choices, not having E, which, <laughs> which is the winner one, I think A is one that is the best. Okay. All right. just, just so I understand, when you say voluntary, you mean that the person who's wearing the thing chooses when it's on. Mm -hmm. For your company. If it makes my heart beat three times as fast and I die, then I have liability because mm -hmm. I'm the one who... If instead it's a company product, the, the rules are different. Huh? If it's a company owns my PC, they're allowed to read everything I write because it's the company. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference, uh, at, say, contract, or depending on whether you are the the active part or passive. And so the question whether it's voluntary or obligatory is the key one in my view. Thank you. Sander. Yeah. Can I add to that? Because as I understand this product, which I find unethical in the first place, uh, <laughs> I would want to quit as well. But um, <laughs> you know, we're part of this, so let's sit it out. <laughs> now, I think my point I wanted to make is that if this is with for our for clients who are employers who give their employees these bracelets, I don't think there's ever uh, a question about voluntary or not because there's no sort of real choice between an employer-employee relationship, which is partly why I think this is an unethical product. Um, but I look forward to exploring the most sort of ethical choice between this for non-ethical choice. I said handcuff because yeah. it means that, that you can't take it off. But yeah. people will destroy things that don't have, they, you know, people will destroy things. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think um, let's keep going along. We're going to keep like playing in here, and then we're also going to kind of zoom out later after. Any other thoughts from, would you like? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure, maybe I should stand over there. So assuming I'm working for Evil Corp and, and I'm not quitting because I knew what I'm deciding for, um, I think, okay, we're doing something really bad, so let's maybe use the data at least out of it. So I'm not sure what is the difference then because this data... It's up to you to decide. Uh, okay. This, we, this we, we, we get it in and we, we can use greater computational capacity on our servers to provide more services, but then we don't use the data to do longitudinal overviews and things like that. We just delete it. Okay, so I'm, I'm standing here. <laughs> um, I assumed our company was relatively ethical um, and that, when, and that no, hardly in, no company can make you do anything. You can quit and you sign a contract in that kind of sense. And also in the company that probably instigated a solution, in my mind, probably wouldn't be one, uh, is one where they are, there were the people who are trying to implement it would actually be looking out for their well being. Mainly because, mainly not for the actual um, first kind of interest of their employees specifically but because they know the correlation between well-being and productivity is one that is a very good correlation. So you do want your employees to have a good well-being. And wh whether it's a shackle or not, we haven't decided that. Um, we don't know the nature of our company, what we plan to do with the data, um, essentially. So I'm on the sense that if we are an, an actual ethical company and we want to provide the employees with the most benefit from an actual tracker, you'd want to be able to do a lot of um, you, um, versatile things. Because for one, I wear a tracker. It's been very helpful for me in my everyday life. Um, and it's um, really impacted my health. 
Um, so I think there are a lot of things you can do in this tech space to actually help employees. And if the data does get back to your uh, to the companies in in mind, it's their it's their prerogative or how they have their employee employer relationship. Um, so that's kind of how I approached it and came to this side. And I have worked well. I, I got to move around my company, so I was in the data in one of our data analytics um, uh, side of, uh, side of things. However, um, we didn't when you don't have when you don't because of our policies and stuff. We only had a small set data of our actually internal fleet, and doing that kind of stuff makes it very hard to um, actually test and innovate and be actually uh, provide the best features possible. So this seemed like the best option to me from my purely engineering background rather than um, I don't know as much about ethical um, considerations here. So that's my two cents on the matter. Well, I'm here oh, in sorry. The... oh, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> um, so I chose option D because I uh, honestly don't see much of the problem. If, uh, as a, like if an employ employee doesn't have anything to hide, I, I, I mean, and uh, I, I don't have anything to hide. It's, it's better if they know more about me so that they understand if I'm concerned, if I'm, sometimes I'm shy, you know, now I wasn't, but like sometimes I can be. And if they can track from my pulses that I want to say something, but I, I'm sort of holding back, you know, in those moments it might help. So, you know, I'm in D. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. As we continue, we're going to, like, literally, we are the ones deciding stuff and changing also what those even decisions, how they are defined. So please, like, keep that in your mind, all of us. We're going to decide. So in this moment, maybe one question would be, like, how do we understand our decisions? Like, okay, if it should be C or A, well, like, what is, what is the thing that pulls you towards one or the other? Um, so we just wanted to share that there's some recent kind of reflection and thought put towards what our kind of north stars are at Wherewell. Um, and the two biggest, like most important stars for us are this notion of well-being, um, that everyone in our company who are developing things and also in all of our products is trying the most to keep each other's well-being in mind throughout the day. So this, this mentality should be within everything that we put out onto the market and should be run somehow within our own company as well. And then secondly, the notion of privacy. So for us, um, the idea of privacy is extremely important. And we're trying as much as we can to design all of, all of our products with privacy um, at the forefront. But as you can see, these are two, you know, these are just two of our big North Stars. So in this moment, we want you to kind of take a moment and you can chat as well if you want to think about whether these kind of stand true for you all as well as working here. Um, for Irina and I, for Irina and me, I think it's, yeah, we feel quite strongly about these. But we want you to each take a moment and think, um, how are these for you? Do you have any additions or edits? Hmm? Um, I think uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why I ended up uh, on C, which I wasn't really expecting necessarily, um, is to think about the uh, extreme uh, quality of workplaces these days where there is sexual harassment, there is sexism, there is injustice. Um, and one of the companies that I know and I've been supporting for a few years makes a wearable necklace for people who work on call centers uh, very late at night in India because not only will they be raped by the security guard, but they will be raped by the taxi driver who's supposed to drive them back home at 2 in the morning. And so having as much information as possible about the inside location of the employees has become paramount and being able to know who is in the same space in order to fire the right people becomes paramount. So an extension of well-being, which can be interpreted in a Western society um, with fairly good structures, can also be in other contexts more life-saving. And I think businesses have a stake in, in that extension of well-being. 
That's great. Would you add safety to the kind of list? Okay. But I think from a marketing perspective, I think um, Wearwell would not do well with adding safety because then its customer base would be changed to a very different kind of customer base. Mm -hmm. And so in order to thrive in Western nations that can pay more for Wearwell, you have to talk about mindfulness and um, you know, well-being, and in order to then possibly get larger contracts somewhere else, because yeah. the functionality allows it anyway. Great. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's in a very interesting uh, different setup. But in that condition, assuming that this would be the sort of purpose for which this product is developed, the point is since you're only trying to uh, fire the right person that is not even prevent the problem from happening in the first place, then I guess you could equally uh, start promoting this idea, but then only uh, where one of those that doesn't actually, that just to pretend like you have pretend cameras, just have a pretend uh, that wouldn't collect data on you maybe, but that would actually uh, warn the other people that uh, someone knows where you are when in fact they don't. You see what I mean? To some extent, this, well, yeah, because that's the, that's the same result. If, so basically what you suggest, so you, as a company, we could just well, sell the entire operation, if you see what I mean. It only works until the first time that actually needs to be put into practice, and it turns out there is no data on the thing, and then we're dead. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean... I think that the risk, you know, the, the insurance risk, if someone, let's say, Vodafone comes to us and says, we want to buy 5,000 of these for all our shift workers who are female mm -hmm. to work in our call center in Mumbai. Um, and it turns out we're not collecting the adequate amount of data to provide a service or an extension or perceived extension of our services, then we're in trouble. So it's from a personal data perspective, it makes sense from a provisioning of enough information to allow the kinds of interactions that we seem to be talking about, which is employee to manager to other. Yeah, we're still talking about yeah. making money, though, or avoiding to uh, incur... Uh, no, service. but if we That's can't provide the service, so. then we would not be making money. We can sell the products. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. things are often sold as SaaS products anyway. So it's a longitudinal, you know, it's a long contract for five years because you get the hardware and then the software relationship. Mm. And one of my considerations to be in this line if, if we don't make the product, someone else will. That's just like the other story about yeah. the energy. I have nothing to hide. It's a typical excuse. Uh, no, but, but if we... It, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If, if, <laughs> if, if we don't make the product, someone else will. And by uh, providing it in a sense that you have you make some control to the one wearing it, that you can adapt it to context, to, to different situations. Uh, you empower the, the, the person who's wearing it instead of the employer itself. I mean, um, basically in the end, I don't believe in the voluntarily, uh, non-voluntarily ID. Uh, Uber drivers will uh, have to wear this in a couple of years. Um, and for them, it's a question between food or no food, and that's not a voluntary decision. So if you put something in the market, make it ethical and, um, Make a, there's no ethical technology, there's only the unethical use of technology. So try to uh, establish that. Okay, so given this picture that we have in our heads now, where it's not just a product and a decision, it's also some ideas around what, what these decisions mean for different ones of us, as we heard. Does anybody want to shift where they're standing? Do you want to move? No? Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, you can quit. But the no, but the thing is, but the thing is this: it's really, really easy to say, "Don't do this. This is bad." It's really easy to say, "Oh my gosh, you're tracking knee-jerk reaction. It's bad." But the thing is, there's nothing. None, none of none of this is just bad or just good. It all has trade-offs, and it's just too easy to say. If you are in the privileged position of, I don't want to do this, I'm going to quit, sure. Yeah. Most people aren't in such privileged positions. And most people aren't in, you know, there's a very particular Western uh, orientation towards, we don't want to be tracked because that's a shackle. 
it's very, very Western view of things, and it's very, very Western uh, position and um, and value. And in that sense, and in that sense, I think sometimes we make assumptions that our view on how the world ought to be is the right one, never reflecting on the fact that what we have allows us to have that view, and the privileges that we have allow us to have that view, and we make assumptions that other people will have the same privileges to make those decisions. So I want to question a little bit on um, the idea that privacy somehow, the particular definition of privacy as not being seen in this particular way by this particular, in, in this particular configuration is so fundamental, other potential benefits are irrelevant. So. Wouldn't that be um, more straightforward to simply, in that case, to simply state what the real purpose of this is? Because, um, I mean, well-being is a very vague, uh, and uh, most typically it's just a way to uh, uh, drown fish, as we say in French. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It makes sense. Obscure anyway. things, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is, we all not by now recognize as a problem, so why not say, look, uh, we just want to make sure that uh, everyone's safe. We have a duty, a legal duty to keep you safe, and you have uh, uh, you have to accept that because those are the working conditions. Then in that case, that would be clearer, no? Okay, so specifically refining kind of our product pitch towards safety. That's what I would propose. That's what you would propose. Well, I guess we could, yeah, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for bringing up user studies because. Yeah, we have some user studies that we can maybe add to the picture. And when we're finished, like making the full picture, we can decide perhaps what is the full, what is the purpose at the end. So we've been uh, kind of just beta testing this uh, using sort of a very basic architecture, but the one that allows a lot of the functionality between the employee and the company um, with one particular company, which we trust, which is a positive company. It does a lot of good for its employees. Um, and so we decided that we're going to interview one of the employees in that company, and we bring you that interview. Thank you very much. So actually, I don't work for, for very well yet. I'm hoping in the future, fingers crossed. Um, uh, but I work for a positive company. And um, I, I'm, I, I work in the sales department, and I have a little small, small two kids. Um, but um, so when uh, Wearwell came with, with this idea to our company, everyone was a bit uh, suspicious, you know, uh, do we have to wear this? Um, but I was always open to the idea because I always liked new technology. And um, for me, particularly, it worked because um, um, it tracks, I can track my period on the app. And uh, then I don't need to go into this awkward conversation with my line manager, who is male. Um, usually, when I, whenever I mention, like, oh, I have a lot of cramps, can I take the day off? He would be like, I'm making excuses. And, you know, whereas now I can show, like, look at my data. You know, it's the, I, I am on my period today. So I don't need to get into that awkward conversation because he can see through the app already. Um, the, only, the only downside. Uh, for me has been uh, in our company application, um, my uh, requirement for the daily meditation goes up during my period days. And uh, I mean, it's okay, but I'm busy. I'm a mother of two and now I need to like put the kids away and meditate for 15 minutes, but that's okay. And uh, I'm learning, you know, it's uh, apparently it's very good for your well-being if, you, if, you, if uh, you're on your period. So I'm enjoying it. And my manager always checks, like, have you done your, you know, before we have a conversation? So, you know, that I'm calm and yeah it's great <laughs> thank you so much Funda we really appreciate it so what we hope is that that gave kind of another dimension of how the product is being used thus far is her supervisor was next to her or <laughs> <laughs> no 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 okay just take a moment for that to sink in we, we're laughing, all of us, about it, but as of right now, this is a real story. And it's also a story that talks about a potential positive uh, engagement 
and brings in a voice that isn't commonly heard. I mean, admit it. As soon as she said period tracking, you all got slightly uncomfortable. Um, in the workplace. Sure. Okay, period tracking is like whatever. But in the workplace, sharing, sharing it with the boss. like. Well, sure. Well, but then I don't need to go into the awkward conversation. I don't need to tell him, like, look, or he doesn't need to, like. It know, doesn't need to be period. Well, it's just. Actually, in the first place, the issue is somewhere else. And we're is. trying to. Technology and we will get there, absolutely. Structurally, there are some issues. We are bringing in a, a, a solution, um, and we're promoting a solution. We're thinking about um, the ethics of what we're doing, and perhaps we're making in what we would see a more ethical product. Nothing can ever be completely ethical. Um, but uh, yeah, you're right. But at the same time, I think the first time we ran this workshop, uh, we had a lovely uh, participant uh, from uh, from Turkey, actually, uh, who said, who who went uh, went over to Option D and said, "You guys are all crazy. You know, this company is giving you a device. Your employer is giving you something for free. They clearly care about your well-being, and this may be useful to me. This never happens. This is not how things work. This is amazing." It's a perspective that comes from a different set of experiences and a different background. And the idea that maybe there are different um, situations, structural conditions, where something like this may make a difference in a way that you don't um, expect. But, but, but these differences, I mean, we, we didn't specify the context in which our thing would be used. The company you mentioned is very different from, I don't know, ID, perhaps, perhaps not, but it, it, it makes a difference who is tracked. I mean, like you said, it's fine, like you, um, you use something like that, I think, like in reality, but as an, as an engineer, it, I'm assuming it might be easier to find work than, let's say, if you're working at ID at the, at the cashier point, like the, the risks attached to it are, are different. When individual and cultural expectations, all of that. So the, the the examples that you mention, like our product cannot address all of them. Like we, I mean, we we kind of have to make a choice where exactly for whom we wanna we wanna use this thing. Absolutely. Well, that's assuming that it wouldn't be suddenly then like taken by like I don't know my sister who decides that actually would be super useful for her and she flies off to California or wherever else, right? So to some extent, we have to consider the concept of scale, as in what if, like, if our goal is to be successful and to have everybody use this, shouldn't we design it, like, with multiple possible use groups? Yeah, but it's difficult to, to kind of be whatever we mean by an ethical company or have these, these guiding stars that have no teeth and can be stretched in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. Like either we make some like if we want to like be this as a company, then I I think we have to ha have a very specific idea where we're gonna like who are we selling this for, mm -hmm. and what are our limits that cannot be stretched by like let's say a good offer comes around or. So what would you be comfortable with? Who should we sell it to? Should we sell it to exclusively companies in India that have an issue with uh, safety and being a focus on that, uh, or should we think about uh, Amazon? Uh, warehouses um, and perhaps doing something that actually does demonstrate that people don't have enough time for bathroom breaks or have a falling down with uh, a heart condition or should we have it in a company that many of you are working in perhaps where it's really something that um, perhaps it's voluntary perhaps it's something that allows you to either communicate with a manager or maybe just count your steps. What is it, now that we've sort of talked about all of this, um, what, what is it do you think that is viable? Where, where, where would you want to go? Well, OK. Let's think with what is viable. Oh, we all have shares. We all, we all, we all, we all, we all fall. We rise and fall. We all rise and fall with the company. The company's, the company's future is our future. We all rise and fall with it. We, uh, we have shares. Well, shouldn't we have at least um, 
if not an Indian designer for Indian pictures or Turkish or so, I mean, clearly um, you were suggesting that collectively we misunderstood because we were representing one particular angle so are we not lacking a variety of opinions should we involve those specific different zones in the user that's, base that's that's user uh, sure that's 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 a way to go uh, so assuming assuming um, assuming that uh, this is the direction in which we want to go oops before I fall over uh, <laughs> Assuming this is the direction in which we want to go, there are certain things that we're going to have to make decisions about. But, okay, so what Max has just said that this is too difficult. We can't think of everybody being the user and all the different contexts. We need to think of one context design for that and perhaps then we can actually do something and really think about ethics there. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I think the the... Uh, exam question, as the English would say, the exam question is also the fact that none of what we can come up with will ever deal with your travel issue. So the fact that the product travels either because um, the Chinese manufacturer makes a low-end copy, sells it off to someone else, or someone misinterprets it because I can absolutely see a Californian singularity type obsessed person who starts to you know really go into bio tracking to the nth degree and then decides that their team performs better if everyone is mid-cycle and so they have brainstorms during that week you know i can believe i can put i can place myself in all of these different scenarios and ooh, and i so i don't know that it's ever really possible to say I can contain the damage and that I can design to contain the damage because you're never fully, as a company owner, as a manufacturer of both the software and the hardware, perfectly in control of how your idea is disseminated, how the product is disseminated, where it is sold, where it might be abused. Which kind of begs the question, well, first of all, brings up the fact that here in this session, like none of us are necessarily going to come up with the answer or like the perfect situation at all. This whole experience is really about bringing out the discussion and the questions that you're asking are incredible. So that's like A, from an overview. But then B, when I think, when I hear you say this, exactly I think about like, the decision basically, okay, so do we just not make things at all? Like, or do we quit and let other people make them because they, they, they disturb us so much that we can't work on it? But if we don't work on it, then your, your voice theoretically is literally gone. Like, no one cares what you say. So it's, it's definitely like there's no easy answer, I don't think. Uh, well... <coughs> Yeah, in the interest of just kind of um, putting more ideas out there or solutions to kind of move things forward. Um, I like to kind of design with um, as many options in mind and then having choice. So having a, having a sliding scale of privacy where um, the company, no matter in all these situations, the company who it, the client gets an aggregated report, that is, that is always going to happen. But then you could have a manager portal where people who then choose to share the data with their line manager, no one else, just their line manager, can then have access to their what, aggregate, what data they choose to then give to them. And in uh, whatever case of the privacy policy you choose will then depend on how we'd handle your data. And you'd have to put that in a, well, a lot of companies nowadays have a, t a friendly version of the terms and conditions. So you don't actually have to read all the legal jargon if you don't want to. You can kind of get the bullet points and then it links to wherever in their terms and conditions, you get specific policies. So when you have varying degrees of privacy policies, that is a way to kind of counteract it. Obviously, human nature, some people will still click it and not care, and some people will read it to an nth degree. But it is something as a way that some people can have some options um, in that scenario. And options are important. And I think there's quite a lot of work that has been put into making those options more obvious, more visible, easier to process, easier to make, and perhaps shifting some of that decision-making 
to the client. Um, one of the issues with that is our third intervention where, yeah, we get, we, can, we get data and we can do things with it. Sometimes we can't predict how well we can do things with it. For whom? For some people, perhaps better. For some people, worse. Algorithms are tricky beasts. Um, depending on how much data you get, it really uh, affects how well you can train an algorithm to do the things that you want it to do. Um, not getting data means you can't fix the kinds of typical and predictable problems that you get from the fact that uh, our trading data is crap. There's a lot of trading data out there that is not very good, um, that is biased. So fixing that requires data, but it also requires the decisions that we make that have some impact on data. And it also means that if our clients or our users make those decisions that you describe, they would have to be able to actually understand the complexity of something that goes on behind the, behind the surface that sometimes, no matter how clearly you, you explain the legalese, is not predictable. So, one last decision. Does anybody want to move? <laughs> have you been convinced by this side or this side? Or kind of have, have you changed your mind based on what you learned? <laughs> OK, bye. If you're, if you're out, I'm sorry, but you don't have a voice currently. So if I were an employee and I would offer another option, I would say, well, you know, we have the tech lash now. We see people being more critical of these things. What if we try to become the company, we're a small company after all, with a different value proposition where we say um, our interpretation of wellness is that uh, we protect psychological security. So this idea that people can be themselves and not feel tracked. So we go totally full privacy um, and uh, uh, yeah, go into that niche of making fully price friendly products uh, and be ahead of the market in that, that sense. But, um, okay, so basically you're saying none, uh, no aggregate reports at all. Yeah, exactly. You know, aside from the non-aggregate reports, these three choices are still there. And what do you mean by, not, by, by completely privacy friendly if the amount of functionality that you can provide depends on the kinds of data that you can or cannot collect? from the devices in their use. Well, that's exactly that's the point, always right? there. There's a lot of assumptions in that sentence, right? So that it assumes that you want to have the data in the cloud so you can offer more functionality. But you can also explore how you create, could recreate a lot of the functionality you're talking about while keeping data fully local. That's what one of my projects does that. I, I create a price-friendly smart home and it recreates 90% like of what a smart home can do fully local. Right? So um, you know, no data, data goes outside at all. And you still have things like voice control and all that. So, um, in the same situation, I would say, let's create an armband that shows that you can actually have all those features you want fully local and invest in designing that and, and uh, getting some experts in and thinking out of the box, outside of Silicon Valley box to do that. And that might create a unique value proposition that no other company has, but that's you know, increasingly people want. So what would the value I, proposition uh, look like? Because you still have this unequal relationship between employers and employees, yeah. which is a fundamental flaw in the company. Sure, but you could avoid that by making, uh, not re replicating that dichotomy uh, between the, you know, in the product. So if the product does not send any data to the employer. What's the value proposition? Well, the, the, the employer says, I want to make you understand better your patterns in your life and, and things. But that, that does not automatically lead to the conclusion that the employer also needs to have access to that data, does it? If you really, you know, if that's really the, the thing you want as a company, then you should be fine with giving people the tools to do it themselves. And, and trust that there will be good results from that. There's no, no need to have insight in that as a company in that proposition. Oh, I mean, yeah, but privacy friendly Fitbits, yeah. <laughs> but the, the, I mean, um, uh, maybe it's the same point I made before, but this, this power relation is very different depending on who you, who you ask for. Like it might even be turned around if a company has like, we have these five people that we want to keep under all circumstances. And we really like, it's, it, we have to make them happy because otherwise they leave. Like then it's so we, I think without being specific, we might not be able to limit like who's using it, but but uh, the, the, the problem is a different one. You're making the assumption too, you're reversing the assumption. Your assumption is you, your priorities, your priorities are very specific. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and the question is whether those priorities are ones that, um, that should be oriented in this way and who decides that. Can I, can I just be, be the capitalist in the room in the sense that um, we are a small company now, but we'd like to either remain at the size we are or keep growing in order to fulfill a, a variety of clients and a client needs. And so uh, we have to be able to sell a percentage of units to a customer. And if we can't quantify the advantage, i.e. to say we have decreased the number of people who leave the company on average by 10%, and therefore that's worth to them in HR, X amount, and therefore they're happy paying for something that fundamentally will still cost a pretty penny. It won't be less than you know 75 euros per armband or something like that. If we can't quantify that because we have no data, then we will find that our customer base is very small, and we as a company cannot survive. So that'll be the that would be the CEO who's not in the room and in his conference in Paris when he comes back we'll have to have that conversation with him. So I'm, I'm totally with the gentleman who was standing over there. Um, but then we need to switch markets, obviously, because if we can't like show to employers why they want to buy this armband, that's why I think the argument with the lady from Turkey doesn't work, because like no empl employer would buy like this fitness bracelet for their employees to just make them happy. Like They want to get a use out of it. So if we want to make a totally local, totally private uh, fitness tracking armband, then we need to position our company to be like to um, consumers and not to like business to business. I, I know I don't work for very well, but you know, in, in positive company that I work for, um, one of the reasons I'm very excited about this product is that um, the data can tell new things. So if we set it up in a particular way uh, with the gentleman who resurrected in our company, uh, <laughs> um, I think that would be very inflexible. We can't just like think and um, set what this device is going to measure and not measure from the beginning because maybe the data will get, give us insights that might be good to measure and uh, do something about it later on. And uh, one idea um, I had was, um, my, you know, when I'm at work, if the tra if the tracker can also, I don't know, has a microphone or something and can track um, my voice, and uh, if I'm, you know, um, men speaking is a major issue in our company, even though it's a it's a like a we're a positive men's men's planning and men speak as well, like uh, men just dominate the whole speak even in uh, private conversations. So there I would be able to tell and show because when I talk about this, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, you're a feminist uh, and I get this away and I don't want to be, you know, um, a person who's this away. So yeah, I mean, I see a lot of potential in general. Yeah, it's every single part of this is tricky, right? Because over there in another company, maybe there's women speak, actually, can be also. Yeah. Alex? It's yeah. rare, but I mean... Sure. Can, can I also uh, suggest that there's a kind of, um, there's a natural point at, at which if I was working um, on such a product, I would then ask myself, at which point does the competition become mobile phones? in the sense that a dedicated external device that has some bits of display, other bits of display, when you talk to me about period tracking as well as um, uh, mansplaining, so we're talking about speech-to-text analysis, we're talking about quite heavy-duty stuff, which I imagine people like Slack, Clue, Clue Slack integrations, etc., will kill our market. And so how much stuff do we want to lay in, you know, we want to lay into and we want to uh, make sure happen with our product, figuring out the core product and the core feature set, I think will help us also make a set of decisions. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, there is like some fundamental assumptions and questions that uh, beyond if this product works or not, I think we, this will be, uh, setting a certain frame for life. That, so it has serious implications. The fact that we relate labor to fitness and to sport and to well-being. I mean, I do yoga and I try to connect to my body and I think this is well-being and not 
how many steps I track. So even if this product is good, I think it's setting up something that could be really bad for the future. Absolutely. So um, let me actually walk you through what we are what we're doing here. So what we've done is we've given you uh, a, a non-winnable situation for people wanting to be virtuous and wanting to do good in the world. We gave you a product that immediately makes a lot of people's skin crawl, even though many of us have tracked our steps before, just to see how many, how many we walk for various reasons. Um, and we put it into a context that makes things tricky, and we've tried to challenge you to think in different ways. And so I want to um, actually explain to you what it is that we've been doing. So, so what we've done is ethics is intervention. We didn't talk about ethics. You, brought, you guys have brought up ethics, but we never actually talked about what do we mean by ethics here. So let us tell you a little bit about what we've been doing. What is this thing that we've done here and why we've set it up this way? Um, our first, we set up a, a situation that is uh, to some extent fairly familiar as um, the product, just creating the product and deciding what to do with the data. And then we put in some interventions. So our first intervention was to think about values. What do we want to known for? What's our North Star? What are the principles we want to be thinking about? And in essence, how do we want to be good? All right. Um, I'm switching hats here. Now I'm back to my usual self. <laughs> uh, um, one of the uh, ethical frameworks, um, ethical schools of thought we're working with is uh, virtue ethics. Uh, it's a long tradition that comes, um, it's, it comes it goes back into Stoics, actually, uh, but, but was uh, popularized by Aristotle, um, virtue ethics, Nicomachean ethics. And uh, we are uh, approaching virtue ethics from a very pr practical point of view as the principles uh, that guide our action. The virtue tradition um, is somewhere in between um, both the, the, the saints, so it has a, also a very scriptural um, connotation to it, you know, the Ten Commandments, um, but also it has uh, Gandhi, but values can be also um, just secular, the kind of things that we want to live by and the kind of uh, the values that we would like to see um, and the principles and rules uh, that we would like to, uh, to be implemented into technologies, but also regulations and policies. Every ethical framework has its limits, and virtue's limit is the, fact that the, is, is the fact that it focuses on the individual and their values and their principles and the idea that this is um, people that develop moral character know how to act in a way that allows everyone to have a good life. Yeah, and in that regard, uh, we wanted to build an approach that is different than consequentialist ethics, which uh, basically dominates all the discussions around ethics. When you mention ethics, they're, they're, everybody tells us basically, yeah, yeah, it's very important. We need to think about the future. We need to think about uh, what's going to happen if we build this product. Uh, but we realize that we cannot really predict the future. We, we can't really know what kind of companies or technologies will take up our idea and develop it in different or similar ways or put it into a different context. So, um, but the, the same thing about a, uh, an individual having to think about consequences was also reflecting in the virtue. A, a, a person needing to be virtuous and have to take up all that ethical responsibility to be able to decide, yes, this is the, the values. Even when we, uh, sorry, even when we think about the values of a company, uh, it becomes a question about whether the values of a company um, whose values are those, basically? Um, are they the values of the CEO? Are they the values of the founders and the co-founders? Uh, and if there were a group, they, let's say they were a collective, um, what happens when the collective shifts, when people quit, when people move jobs? Um, do the values stay similar, or they just become um, the value manifesto on a company's about us uh, page, but then no one actually updates it in the 12 years of its life? I'm sorry, you were going to say something. Understand so the consequentialism basically, especially uh, in technology, utilitarian um, leg of arm or 
branch of consequentialism, uh, basically looks at uh, what's the benefit of it, what's the utility in making a decision. And um, there are different types of utilitarianism as well. You know, some people like Bentham would say, um, what's the best outcome for the highest number of people? So there, the importance would be then, you know, if, if a trolley is running into a crowd, let's say the most, most number of people. But then similar kinds of consequentialism um, can say, let's not kill the babies because they have a potential future, whereas it's okay to, you know, kill, run into, uh, run across, uh, run over people who are over 80 because they don't have much long to live anyway. Or uh, if you go into the MIT uh, labs, um, moral machine website there they have various iterations and uh, the most for instance striking one for me when we started the project was uh, large people um, so they didn't want to call them fat so they called them large people you know whether it's okay to run over large people because obviously they're not taking care of themselves so what do we need to take care of them. So consequentialism really uh, puts the emphasis on what comes after a technology is built. Whereas we're trying to build a framework that looks into what goes into the process of building a technology. So the next intervention that you saw was one where we brought a voice that perhaps was talking about topics and uh, talking in a way that isn't commonly heard. It's an effort to bring in a different voice, and it's an effort to show that there are, we're all entangled in different ways. We all have obligations and responsibilities. And we're all mostly trying to figure out how we relate to companies, to each other, and managing those relationships. And so this comes from a different ethical framework, and it's the ethical framework of care. Care ethics. Uh, looks at, as Irina mentioned, the relations, the entanglements that we, we have. So uh, one of its main con uh, contextual points is that we're all embedded in relations and all the decisions we make need to be negotiated based on the relations that we have. So that also affects the, the kind of power relations and uh, who gets to speak and who has a voice in a decision, in a decision making process. And um, it's about building empathy and the ability to transform because uh, transform into someone else's point of view. And uh, perhaps the most important thing about care relations is that it signifies a particular relationship of power because it's un unidirectional. Someone cares and someone gets taken care of. Um, but that means that the, the care um, takes care in a per perhaps in a way that the, the one who's taken care of might not always relate to. So the care ethics um, takes that aspect of the unidirectionality of care as we understand it usually and switches, a, switches, switches it around and says, um, how about if we look at the relations in a broader way and contextualize how those relationships would look if both sides of the party would empathize with the other's position. It's about imagining an otherwise. Clearly also, when you care for someone deeply or something deeply, it's a form of vulnerability. Uh, care can also result in hurt and pain. And so in that sense, care offers and uh, forces us to think about our obligations and responsibilities to each other and how we need to negotiate these given on the kinds of lives we want to live and the kinds of constraints that we live in. And so the final aspect of what uh, we've been talking about here is the notion of constraint. Um, before we go to the constraints, one thing about care I would like to add that there's a limit to care. There is only so much and so many people that we can care about. Um, and that's our individual limit, but there are also companies and uh, structures and organizations. They need to focus their care, because otherwise it, it becomes impossible. And so the last uh, intervention, uh, one that we didn't spend much time on, uh, but one that comes in and says there's only there are limits to what we can provide. There are limits to what we can do. There are structural limits. There are technical limits. There are limits to what our capacities are for creating change. Um, and that's the capabilities approach. 
So the capabilities approach is not an ethical school of thought per se. It comes from development studies literature, uh, was developed by Amartya Sen, and uh, for poverty studies basically to understand what the poor are actually capable of. And it was a critique of all the sort of top-down um, developmentalist approaches that comes from the West usually to the East that this will work for you. It's sort of the, the nudge ethics, pers uh, the nudge um, perspective that, you know, if you nudge the poor in a particular way they will figure it out it's just that they need to get that initial push um, so this this cap capabilities approach was developed as a reaction to that that you need to understand the contextuality of um, how uh, a person reacts to that nudge and what it means for that posi uh, person's position if you do interventions like those so the capabilities approach uh, and the way we interpret as an ethical approach here looks at the structures. What are we actually capable of? What's our capacity to act in a, in a certain way? What's our capacity to act within the values that we selected for ourselves, that we defined as we care about? But we know that there are limits. And within those limits, what's our actually action point? And what kind of steps can we take? And what kind of steps perhaps we need to hold back a little? because. Perhaps we're not there yet. Uh, perhaps we don't have the human resources or the financial resources to be able to do those. Um, but it's sort of a situated understanding of what we can actually achieve. And the capabilities approach is interesting because designers and developers are in an extremely interesting and important position of power where all of us as designers and developers in any company are working within a set of constraints. We have constraints if we are a startup, but our company needs to survive. We have to be capitalists at some point. Uh, if we are working for a larger company, we may really want to keep our job. We have to pay rent. But there are other things. There are legal limits. There are technical constraints that we all have to work within. But at the same time, when we create technologies, we're creating how things will be. Technology is necessarily a future-oriented. What we create is how things might happen, how things will have to happen. And that is, the technologies we create are also about capacities and capabilities. We create and potentially enable some capabilities and limit or disable others by the decisions that we make in the design. And so in that sense, there's real complexity in thinking about what do we mean by ethical position. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of created this triangle of ethical frameworks. Ethics isn't a checklist. This isn't going to tell you uh, this is right or this is wrong. There are ways of thinking. Uh, and each ethical framework by itself has its priorities and the things that it ignores. Um, and uh, we've tried to find a way to meld three different ethical frameworks to really think about what is the set of issues that needs to be Con contemplated and thought through and reflected on um, in, the in, in the development of technology. And that necessarily means throwing, uh, slowing things down because this is hard and it takes time. But perhaps we're past the point of moving fast and breaking things. It's time to chill out a bit. And this kind of framework also helps us um, um, look beyond the consequences because consequences are happening all the time. There is just not one single consequences or a consequence of a decision. You make one decision and it has a consequence, but that consequence tr triggers something else and that has a consequence. So it's a process rather than A to B, rather than A to C. Um, whereas with, um, with this framework, we sift through different values because our situated understanding, our uh, situated context, specific context, uh, both um, shapes the kind of capabilities we have to deal with that context, um, but also it also shapes um, the values and how we see our values might apply to that specific context. And within all of that, we need to care enough to be able to decide to act on that, uh, that context rather than acting on something else. The idea of each of those theories that we shared with you um, is not necessarily, as I said, not to answer the issues. It's rather to bring the is issues up um, and frame them in different ways um, or reveal ones that you might not have thought of. Thank you all for being here. And let me just uh, tell you that we do have 
tools.